Hey guys, Simon Hayes here. I've been a production sound mixer for 27 years. I use DPA Lavaliers on all of my films. I'm here today with DPA to talk about how you're going to grow your career. When we're looking for new assistants in my department, what we're looking for is ambition. We're looking for people that are keen. We're looking for people that desperately want to be in the film industry, in the sound department. We can teach all of the technical side of what we do. That's far less important than attitude. What I'm really looking for is someone that is going to absolutely love what we do. Someone that definitely wants to be in sound, not someone that's using sound as a stepping stone to get into another department in the film industry. And someone really that loves film, loves television, loves performance. Well, look, the interesting thing is, if you are going to do a course, it's not going to start you any higher up the ladder of, of jobs in the sound department anyway. So you could come in without having been to the National Film School or to Bournemouth or any other of the institutions that are running really excellent sound courses, and you would still be starting in the same position, which is as a sound trainee. What those courses would potentially do is because you've been taught technically and you've got a background and you've almost done your academic learning about sound in one of those institutions are, you're gonna be spending less time um, in the role as a trainee and you're potentially gonna be able to move up faster from trainee to second assistant sound. Is it a good idea? Well, it depends on the individual. What I'm looking for, as I say, is that spark in the eye, the ability to talk to anyone, uh, a self-confidence, and also the ambition and someone that really, really wants to be in the film industry. Whether they're coming straight from A-levels, whether they've been a shoe salesman, or whether they've been to the National Film and Television School isn't that relevant to me. But what I do know is that if they have been to the National Film and Television School, or Bournemouth, or one of the other great institutions running sound courses, is I'm going to have an easier time training them up. So as new people to the sound department are moving through the ranks from trainee up to first assistant sound, my main piece of advice for them is, is don't think that you know it all. Um, because every production sound mixer has got different workflows, has got a different idea about how they're going to record the sound on a movie or on a television show. And there isn't a right or a wrong. You know, sound is a creative medium. And with creativity, there isn't a black and a white. There's various shades of grey. And what I tried to do when I was moving up the ranks was I tried to work with as many different sound mixers as I possibly could. And what I was doing was I was cherry picking parts from their workflow that I thought would work for me when I started mixing and I stole different uh, different ideas from different sound mixers. What I thought some sound mixers were particularly good at, I would steal from their repertoire. Um, but what I was very aware of was to not say to a production sound mixer, well, why are you doing it like this? The guy I worked with last week did it a different way. You know, I would hear them out and I would, uh, you know, your job as part of the sound team is to do what the production sound mixer asks you to do. So whatever workflow um, they wanted me to get involved in, I would be fully supportive of. Um, even if I thought it was a bit crazy what they were doing, I'd think, okay, well, this is different. Is there something I can learn here? So be aware that part of your job description as an assistant in the sound department is to support the production sound mixer's workflow and the way he wants to uh, record a scene, however that is. I don't think that there's ever a time where you can say, I'm ready. I think that what you do in the film industry is when there's an opportunity, opportunities don't always knock twice, you take the opportunity. And my personality and the way that I did things was, if I got an opportunity, I would grab it with both arms and I would say, yes, 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 I can do that. And then I would go home and say, okay, I've just committed to something. 
uh, I'm now going to sit down and technically work out how I'm going to achieve um, what I've just been offered. And that's how I started production sound mixing. Um, basically, I did every single short film I was offered. While I was boom operating, I was, I was going and, and mixing short films for directors who were starting their careers. So there is a really buoyant short film industry. Um, and what I would say is my advice would be go and get involved, go and do those films. There's often no money involved. I would never ever recommend people to work for no money, but if you're on a, a project of love where the director isn't getting paid, the DP isn't getting paid, well, guess what? The production sound mixer isn't going to get paid either. And that really can be a fantastic training ground for young technicians moving up. What you don't do is you don't go and do a low-budget feature film for no money. I'd, I'd absolutely advise against doing that. But when we're talking about people uh, trying to make showreels, directors trying to make showreels, perhaps they're an actor trying to get into directing, perhaps they're someone that's just left film school trying to get into directing, all of that kind of content is a really, really great place to go and be uh, a production sound mixer if right now you're a, uh, you're a sound assistant. And what I would say about that is, is and you know, this, this is again, I'm not suggesting that people should make mistakes at work, but if you're not getting paid, you will be forgiven for making minor mistakes. Let's all try not to make mistakes. But if you're on a, a freebie eight minute short film, um, perhaps you can you can start to uh, start to work out through trial and error what your workflow is, what works for you, and the you know what what you're going to be doing as a fully fledged production sound mixer in the future. What I try and do about conflict is to never ever get to a stage on a film set where I am in conflict with anyone, whether it's another HOD, certainly not with a director, any of my crew. Um, it's a collaborative process, it's a creative process. There are going to be differences of opinions and regarding uh, the sound department being given a lower priority, well guess what? Filmmaking is a visual medium. Everyone is going to really, really care about the picture and have a little bit less care about sound, but I don't treat that as a negative, I treat it as a positive. I've tried to spin it into a real positive. Um, you know, the sound department are not going to have people uh, getting involved in exactly how we record the sound. Everyone's got an opinion about what the camera should be doing, about how the makeup should look, about how the costume should look. You know, with sound, the great thing about the sound department is we're left to our own devices a lot of the time. Now, regarding the word conflict, um, what I try and do is I recognise if I think that I'm going to have trouble with a certain department head from another department, I just try and be really, really nice and collaborative with them. I make sure that they know everything that I'm thinking. You know, the, the one that I would always use in it as an example is costume. You know, it's going to, that we are going to have situations in the sound department where we're going to be viewed negatively by the costume department because guess what? We're putting equipment under their beautifully made costumes. We're essentially going to be attaching lavaliers to their costumes and that needs to be treated delicately. We need to give them the respect that they deserve. We need to think about it from their point of view. And the way that I often do that, in fact, the way that I always do that is by getting in early and talking. The earlier you can start talking to other HODs in other departments and to let them know what your intentions are about how you're going to record a scene and about how that it could potentially impact their department, the better it is. Have the conversation, don't save it till the last minute. Okay, so the, the big question, doing another take when the director and the actors want to move on. It's a really, really tough one, guys, because certainly as sound mixers, we should never be cutting the take when something goes wrong. That's not our job to do. Unless the director specifically says in the interview stage or at the beginning of the movie, listen, if something's not working for you, I'm happy for you to cut it. You should assume that they don't want you to cut it and you should never cut the take. Um, what we should be doing as production sound mixers is going to the director after the take and letting them know that there was a problem. Now, how do we negotiate for another take when the director wants to move on? My main piece of advice about this is do it sparingly. Don't be the little boy or the little girl that cried wolf. Um, if you're always asking for another take, they're gonna stop listening to you. 
it may happen to me once per movie that I ask for a different take. What we've got to remember, and this is part of due, doing your due diligence and knowing how the dialogue editing process works, knowing how the picture editing process works, knowing that if there was a slap bang on one word, that that dialogue editor is going to be able to steal that syllable where there was a bang uh, from a different take and replace it. You know, the the the. The big questions are things like aeroplanes. You know, we're not going to be able to remove an aeroplane. You are going to need to go again. And what I would say about that is be very, very sure about it. So the first thing that I'm going to be is very, very strong in my conviction when I go to the director. The second thing is I'm going to go immediately. I'm going to be out of the chair on the sea of cut so that before the first assistant shouts, right, we're moving on, check the gate, I'm already talking to the director because once they've yelled check in the gate, it's really, really hard to reel them back because the, the actors have come out of the moment and the director doesn't really want to put the actors through that. He wants to keep them in the moment. So it's a case of getting to the director fast. So here's another really, really big thing. Make sure your sound cart is at all times as close to the director as possible. Don't do that thing of being miles away behind the set because you won't be able to get there fast enough when there is something you need to talk to the director about. It's really important that you're seen as part of the creative process. Um, the other thing that I will do is, is I won't shout loudly across the set. I don't want any of the other HODs or any of the actors um, to think that I'm dictating to the director what he or she should be doing. I will go and quietly talk to the director so that no one else can hear what I'm saying and I will get there fast and say, that take was completely unusable. You're not going to be able to fix it in post. This is one of the rare occasions where we need to go again. Terribly sorry about that. It's going to take 90 seconds to, to get one more. And generally, when you get across there that quick, you say it quietly, sit straight to the director on a one-to-one -one basis, not across the set, so you're looking like you're trying to tell them what to do, then generally you will get that one more take. Um, so speed, conviction, and one-to-one. -one. 